Welcome to OutDrive, folks. I'm your host, Cliff Callis, and each week I'm bringing you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. OutDrive is powered by Callis, a full-service advertising agency with a focus on marketing rural America. Callis offers a wide range of integrated marketing services, including website development, search engine marketing, social media, video, and digital. We develop strategic and creative campaigns to build your brand and your business. And you can learn more about us at ecalis.com. Now join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. We've got another great story to share with you today about life and work in rural America. You know, I always get a little extra excited when I get to talk shop on the show with a fellow agency owner and especially one who founded and grew his firm from the ground up just like we did. John Smitty is the founder, president, and lead strategist of Lead Plan Marketing. And over the past 10 years, John has helped market and scale over 200 companies in a variety of industries. He's also the author of a newly published book called Stop Guessing, Start Marketing, which shares the secrets of his marketing formula. He's also a fellow podcaster with a show called Marketing Fundamentals, which you can find on all the podcast platforms. He's a digital marketing expert, and we're thrilled to have him on OutDrive to discuss branding, integrated marketing, and the future of emerging trends and technologies. Welcome to OutDrive, John. Hey, thanks for having me on, Cliff. Been looking forward to it. I always love talking shop with other agency owners and sharing perspective on you know, some of the topics that I think we'll get into today, branding and, you know, scaling a business, maybe up and down and certainly digital marketing and, you know, what's working there and maybe some emerging trends about, you know, things that are happening right now and, and are on the forefront. But before we get into all that, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Sure, no problem. I got involved in marketing. I always say my career started back in about 2005 through 2008. I was a touring artist. So I was a musician. I was traveling, you know, all over the country, nationally performing in front of audiences. And I landed a gig on Vans Warped Tour. So Vans Warped Tour, if you don't know what that is, that is a national tour that has some very large headlining acts on it. And then it also has some smaller bands and smaller acts. I was one of those smaller guys, but I was on a stage that was called the Skull Candy stage. So Skull Candy is a headphone company Mm -hmm. that was just launching back when I was on Vans Warp Tour. And one thing that they did that I love now that I'm in marketing that I can clearly see nowadays is they went directly for their audience. They knew how to pinpoint their audience. They're selling headphones and and who is the one age demographic that always has headphones on? It's teenagers and, you know, younger people. And so they were very smart to identify Vans Warped Tour as a place that they could get directly to their audience. They put up a stage and they hired some artists to be on that stage. And I was one of those artists. So our job was to perform on that stage and promote Skull Candy, hand out their headphones off of the stage, throw merchandise, stickers. We go around and promote that stage. That tour will be at like a fairgrounds. It's a large tour, multiple stages. There's skateboarding tournaments going on. There's like all kinds of things happening. So we would go out into that crowd and promote our stage with Skull Candy's logos all over everything that we were doing. So did that for a few years on and off and then found out I was going to be a dad. And at that time I was 31 years old and really had to assess what I was doing. I was on the West Coast. My girlfriend at the time who was pregnant was back here in Michigan. So I assessed my situation and I thought, I think I need to find a way to take the skills that I've developed as an artist and put them into something that's going to allow me to stay closer to my son and be a dad and and get off the road and, and get out of this touring situation. So a lot of times when I tell the story, it sounds like, oh, then I made this jump and I went from being a touring artist to a marketer. But there was this time period where, you know, I came back to Michigan. I took a job just painting houses 
kind of figuring out how I was going to make this transition. I was playing in a, another band here locally. Well, we were touring kind of regionally, but most of our shows with that band was locally just for extra money. I was promoting shows for that band. And this is right when MySpace was kind of phasing out. Facebook was was coming in and I was using Facebook to create events. And I created this whole process for promoting our band on Facebook and our shows. So as I was doing that, I thought, man, if I could just do this for the band, I'd be happy because I, I always loved performing, but really what I loved about music was the creativity behind it and like writing music. And then I started to really love promoting as I was doing that. So that kind of led me down my career path into marketing. I started just becoming a sponge, learning everything that I could about marketing, taking every course I could find. I took a job with a, a magazine here in town selling ads, which led me to writing copy for those ads so that I could retain my clients and give good offers, help them devise offers. I left that job, went to work for a TV station, did the same thing with TV commercials. And during that time was just really focusing on becoming a better and better marketer for my clients so I could keep them retained. That led me into what is marketing, really studying marketing, learning the fundamentals of marketing. And then I launched my agency in 2016. That's an awesome story. Thanks. That's exciting. It is amazing how kids change your life, right? And usually for the better. Our origin as an agency is very similar. In fact, the first real contract I had was for the cable company. At that time, I got started a few years ahead of you, and they were just starting to do local insertions into national networks. So ESPN, CNN, USA, they were just beginning to put you know regional ads in there, local car dealer, hospital people like that. And I grew up in the retail business and did some marketing for our department stores. And then when I went out on my own, this contract with the cable company kind of allowed me to have some revenues coming in, right? But I got to do all the same kind of things you're talking about, writing copy, directing video, working on the audio side, editing and selling, and then working with the production people to get it in. So I think that's a really great way to learn this business because you end up doing it all, right? Yeah. All that creative stuff too. People ask me if I miss doing music because I don't really do music anymore aside from singing in the kitchen with my kids, you know, but I really don't miss it because I still so involved in so much creativity here at the agency. And that creativity has changed over the years. I have my hands in less things on one side and more things on another side, but being able to do things like I'm doing here today and be on this podcast and, you know, things like that is, is what I enjoy doing. So I've been able to, one thing I love about marketing is I've been able to keep that creative aspect and kind of morph it into a career. Well, it is an avenue for that because, you know, it's always changing, right? We're always challenged to come up with new ideas, looking for that really big idea that you can blow up into a thousand different pieces and it's always changing. And then marketing technologies are just getting faster and faster and, and that spins off new opportunities and new ideas. And so it's probably, as I look back on my career, the thing that I've always enjoyed the most is that creative aspect of the challenge of having to come up with creative ideas, but then having an outlet for expounding those. My wife, is kind of my sounding board on everything. And she's always kind of reeling me back in from, you know, where I get to, but I, I love the creative aspect of our business. That's what we have to do though, is have those big ideas. And then kind of, at least for me, when I'm doing strategy, it's like sky's the limit. What can we do? Get it all out there and then slowly start to reel it back, dial it in, get it within budget for the client, you know, things like that. So yeah, it's, we definitely need those people to reel us in too at times. We do. They're the practical get her done folks is what they are. Right. Well, tell us about your agency. So I started this agency back in 2016 at the time, mainly just doing small business here locally. Started with one other guy, made our first hire. That guy is still with me actually. 
seven years in. At one point, there was 19 of us. Now we're at 11. We're pretty comfortable there. But we, you know, started doing a lot of like local authority marketing. And we started doing brand work, brand strategy work, marketing planning that led us into more e-commerce. Nowadays, we work with a lot of supplement brands and nutrition brands. So we're doing a lot of direct to consumer marketing. Still have a couple clients here locally, you know, some insurance companies and things like that, but we're really focused on the nutrition industry. And we launched a second agency at the end of last year called Nutra Marketers. So it's still new to us. That agency only does supplement and functional food brands. You mentioned branding. And so that's such an important part of everything that we do. What's your perspective on brand identity and what kind of strategies or thoughts or principles do you use to build a brand? At Lead Plan, we always look at a brand as its own person. If this brand were a person, how would it look and how would it sound? So a lot of times when you say branding to an average person who doesn't live in the same space that we live in, they think it's all about the colors and the logo, maybe the fonts. But to us, we're actually designing a character. And so you know, we have a process that we use where we first want to figure out how that character is going to sound. And in order to do that, we need to write the story of that character or that brand. What is it that we're taking to market? And in that story, we want to write that story around the customer that we're trying to attract. So we're tapping into all of their pains, their emotions, their reasoning, so that we devise this story that speaks to that person specifically. We don't ever take that story and just publish it to a website or anything like that. It's an internal document. We call it a brand script. But from that brand script is born headlines, taglines, calls to action, so on and so forth. It will also give our creative team like a starting point to write website copy, advertising copy, Amazon listing copy, whatever we might be doing for that brand. And then next, we want to figure out what's the visual aesthetic of this person. If this was a person, how would they dress? What are they going to look like? That's where the colors and the typography and the fonts and textures and photography styles and all those things come into play. So for us, we create essentially mood boards. We'll give our client a few different directions. We call them brandscapes, but they're mood boards to show a direction for that design. So it gives you as the client an idea of where we would go if you picked this particular brandscape with all the things like the photography or this is what a business card might look like or this is what a label on a bottle for your product might look like things like that so once we've got those two pieces then we can put them together usually it starts with the logo we'll design out the logo And then a lot of times for us, it's label design would be the next thing with a brand new brand because we're usually doing supplement brands. So we got to create a label in the supplement space. It's a little tricky because it's so heavily regulated. The FDA won't allow us to say a lot of things. So I always say like, we got to create this product. We got to be able to say that it's, you know, maybe the last one we did was a testosterone supplement. So we got to be able to say that it will increase your libido, improve your ability to grow or build muscle, increase your energy levels. And we can't say any of that on the label. So (laughs) it's, uh, (laughs) it's a tricky kind of marketing, but that's where that brand script would come into play. Now we're going to go back and we're going to tap into that brand script and we're going to try to come up with a way to say those things that we know is going to tap into the emotional reasoning of the person that we're trying to sell the product to. I love that process. Not ever heard it described exactly how you did that. Very interesting, very insightful. So you're also an author, right? You just wrote a book. Yep. Is that process in the book? Yep. That process is in the book along with the five pillar process that we use for creating marketing strategy. So kind of our secret weapon at Lead Plan is brand strategy with marketing strategy at the same time. We try to build them together. So there's not any kind of a handoff between agencies. But over the years, we've created what we call a P5 marketing strategy. And really, that strategy goes back to my days in music, the parallels between music and marketing are 
are crazy to me because the first thing that we have to do and and what skull candy did very well is we have to be found by our audience so you have to understand you know if you look at music if you're a blues artist well that's a certain kind of an audience and where are you going to find that audience you're going to book shows that are in line with that audience if you're a hip-hop artist that's a completely different audience you need to book shows at clubs and like different types of places that cater to that audience skull candy booked a tour with vans because they knew that that was where the audience was at so in a five pillar marketing plan or a p5 marketing strategy we call it the first pillar is how are you going to be found it, we call it be found so we want to have a full plan so when we're creating a marketing plan we'll map out all of the places that this client of ours audience could be found that we could potentially put a message in front of that audience that's the first piece of that formula once you've got that you need to take it a step deeper now and say once somebody takes action on that that ad if they click that ad and nowadays it's usually digitally is where we're advertising and so if they click it they're going to come to either a website or a landing page and we need to do what an artist needs to do when he's on stage. The artist has to connect with his audience. You have to get that connection and that buy-in from the audience. So this is where we're going back to that brand script and we're pulling out that emotional reasoning messaging that's built around that customer's pain points. We don't wanna bring somebody from an ad to a website or a landing page that just talks about the product. We wanna talk about the pain that person is having that's driving them to look for this type of a product. Donald Miller calls it being the guide. I don't know if you're familiar with Donald Miller mm -hmm. building a story brand, right? We want to guide them and make them the star. And we believe in that heavily here at Lead Plan. The next thing you have to do is creating trust. And when I go back to my days in music, I always think about a rule that we had when we were playing an audience was we had to party with that audience first and play like fun, upbeat music, maybe cover a couple songs that they know if they don't know our music so that they can kind of sing along and get them to buy in and trust us before we go into maybe a slower, more emotional song. Because if you start out with that kind of a song in a set and they don't know that song or you as an artist, you're going to empty that place out quick. They're like, oh, this is slow this is boring we're out of here so you have to get them to trust you in marketing the way that we get trust is warranties and guarantees testimonials and case studies special skills that your employees might have processes that you're using that other competitors aren't using things like that so we want to make sure that we have a plan for how we're going to use those things. We may put together a video of a whole bunch of different people doing video reviews and run that as a retargeting ad for somebody who has been at the website as one example. And then once we've built their trust, we've brought them all the way up to that point, then we can go into the fourth pillar, which is purchase. How are we going to get them to purchase us and become a customer? When I go back to music, it was at the end of the set, you say to your audience, hey, everybody, thanks for coming out tonight. We had a great time performing for you and, and dancing with you or however you want to say it. If you want to meet us, we'll be in the back at our merch booth. We got hats, T-shirts, stickers. Our CDs are for sale if you like the music. And you're making that sales pitch and that call to action. When you're marketing a product or a service online, it's a little bit different. We want to map out all of the different ways or offers that we can make, starting with what is the first purchase offer? So for us with supplements, if it's a first purchase offer, usually it's about 20% off and we'll run that as a retargeting ad. We don't typically have it right on the landing page, although we have, and it's not, I mean, there's exceptions to every rule, but we don't typically have it on the landing page or website or pop up or anything. We bring them in through that funnel. We earn their trust. You know, we get them to know us, show them that we empathize with the pain. Then they start to see our ads 20% off your first purchase. But then we want to map out if we're going to give 20% off of our first purchase, how are we going to get a second purchase, a third purchase? How are we going to get them into a subscription? 
in that fourth pillar of purchase, we're mapping out all the different ways that they can buy. And also a lot of times we're getting into holidays that we want to have special offers or, you know, back to school offer, Christmas is coming, Black Friday offers, things like that. And then the very last pillar is devising a strategy for how you're going to be talked about by that new customer. And this is one that I don't think a lot of businesses really think about. They want to get that new customer and like the job of the marketing strategy is done at that point. But really now we want to get that customer to help us spread brand awareness and bring us more customers. So we want to devise a strategy to get reviews, testimonials, get them to share offers, you know, things like that. We put all those plans together and we have a through and through P5 marketing plan. I love that. You know, it's interesting with agencies because everybody kind of has their own spin on all that. That's usually evolved over the years and gotten better with age, right? Yeah. But everybody kind of has their own unique flair. And I, I like the the P5 approach. And I could see where it would be very, very effective, very effective. And so you've worked with lots of companies over the years and really been able to scale them. How does that work? How are you able to do that? How are you able to partner up with a client and help them grow their brand and their business? It's a whole process, but going through that audit and really finding where the marketing is broken. And a lot of times with companies, I get in there and find that the marketing is not organized well. The marketing first has to be organized. They're Typically, when it comes to marketing, companies will be very reactionary and focused on tactics. They may not know how, why they're using a certain tactic other than their competition is using that tactic. Social media is a great example of that. A lot of companies will be on Instagram, say, because that's where the competitors are at and they feel like they need to have a presence there. But they're wondering why they're not getting any engagement on their posts. And a lot of times it's because there's no strategy behind that post. It's just a post that talks about something that whoever posted it thought up that morning so that they could post it there to keep some kind of a presence. So really getting into who that customer is and mapping out every step of what has to happen one thing that I try to focus on in my marketing career is changing the way that people think about marketing. That's kind of my own personal mission because there's so many different approaches to marketing. There's so many different definitions of marketing for different people. And usually what I find is most business owners focus on the fourth P of marketing, which is promotion which is advertising. And so all things marketing to them are advertising. So they think, you know, maybe a restaurant is going to run a happy hour. They're going to, they got a new happy hour. They're going to pull some billboards for it. They spend five grand on those billboards with a message that says happy hour every day at three o'clock at Pete's pub. And they run it for a month. And they don't really make five grand back off of that ad specifically. And they wonder why, but it's, it's because they're not looking at the big, big picture and they're not going, how are we going to, okay, we, they got the first P they've got their message in front of that audience. Hopefully billboards are a little bit different. You're kind of casting a wide net, but once they come in, what's the experience that we're going to create? How are we going to upsell them while they're in here? If they're coming in for a happy hour, is there a way for us to upsell them into purchasing food along with the drinks that they're having? Can we get them to leave with something to come back with maybe when it's not happy hour and get a sale that way too? Can we incentivize them to bring more people with them when they come? So we want to look at that whole big picture and put a plan together that's going to impact that customer on every step of that buyer's journey. That type of strategizing and planning is what pays off in the end and boosts revenue. Well, you use what I think is the key word there, strategize or strategy. You know, so much marketing can be very tactical in nature. And we find or we see that the why is not there. 
you know, why people do what they do. And you kind of have to help them along that pendulum from thinking about doing something to actually doing it. And the why and the strategy behind that, it really drives them to that point. So I love that approach. There are so many companies that are scalable and many times they don't even realize it, you know, how big they can get. Kind of interesting to see that. And from my perspective as an agency owner, watching one of our clients grow is the most gratifying thing that I do. It's the best. And and especially, you know, when they tell you that. And not all clients do that, right? It's kind of like they're afraid, well, if I tell him things are going good, he's going to charge me more. But I tell you what, to hear that as an agency owner and then to be able to pass that along to the team that's working to help grow that business. I mean, that's that's powerful motivation. We try to do that every Monday. We do our our main team meeting and we have a part of that meeting that's just about wins. Everybody bring a win to the table. What happened last week? And not, and not everybody has a win every week, but we try to get those wins that one department would have, but maybe the other department who had a key role in it wouldn't hear about it because project management is talking about it, but creative department really was behind it. So we want to get like all those wins out because yeah, that's what we all thrive on. It really is. And, you know, not everything's a winner, right? Right. We'd love to think that they're going to be, but not everything is. Hey, before we go any further, why don't you pitch your book? We talked about it. You talked a little bit about some of the content. Content, Stop Guessing, Start Marketing by John Smitty. Pitch that book to our audience for those people who might be interested in picking up a copy. Yeah, that book covers the processes that I've talked about. It's available on Amazon. It breaks down every piece of the branding process, every piece of the marketing planning process, right down into budgeting. We give real world examples along the way. I try to make it so typical business owners who aren't marketing consultants or chief marketing officers or creatives can understand what's being said. I'm not going to use a bunch of technical jargon in that book. I've had several people read it who are clients of mine that commented that they could understand everything that was being said. And we want to give real world examples. I give a lot of those. And then I take a a very large brands marketing and I break it down so you can see how it fits into every pillar, you know, how they're being found, how they're knowing and identifying the customer, how they're earning trust, how they're asking for the purchase, how they're getting talked about. It really is a step-by-step guide to putting together a a brand strategy and marketing strategy. Folks, stop guessing, start marketing with John Smitty on Amazon. Sounds like a great tool for many people to use. So you've been around the industry enough and long enough to see really a lot of change. Talk a little bit about some of the changes that you recognize. I mean, you mentioned MySpace to Facebook and then you dropped Instagram. There's so much more. What are the things that really stand out to you? Isn't it crazy how we've gone from those days and even back to my days of working for the magazine? When I was working at the magazine, print was dying. I could feel it. I was selling ads. It was hard enough to sell the ads because print was kind of on its way out. And then if I did convince a business to buy an ad and an issue or two of that magazine, the ad better work. So I was working hard to make sure that that it was working. And then, yeah, the MySpace days, moving into Facebook. Now I have my son's 14 and those kids hop social media platforms. Like it seems like there's always a new platform popping up. So I wonder if we're going to get to a point where there's larger platforms that help us as marketers manage multiple platforms and understand new ones that are popping up all the time. I think metaverse has the potential to really change the way business is done. The way you and I are doing this interview right now would be completely changed. I mean, we could put on our headsets and be sitting in a room together, interacting as if we were, you know, both in the same room. Yeah. It's crazy to think where that whole thing could go. We've also gone from days of you started out in retail. Now 
retail is definitely relevant, but now we're getting to things like Amazon and big retail outlets like Walmart are selling on their websites. And as a retail outlet, and I do have some clients that are retail outlets, you have to really understand how people are shopping nowadays. They're not just going to your store and looking for what they're in search of. They're going to your website first. They're looking to see if you have that product. They're looking to see if you have it in stock or if they have to order it through the website. And a lot of times if you have it in stock, then they get in their car and they go down to the retail outlet and they pick it up. I've had one retailer in particular that it was several years ago, but we could not figure out why we redesigned her website. Uh, we ran a survey of her customers. We redesigned the website around that survey. We really believed that we were going to get an uptick in conversion rates because of the redesign. And it was like pulling teeth to get anyone to order through that website. She sold like knitting stuff. It was down in Sarasota, Florida. It was like a large knitting store down there. So the demographic is older people and we running all this software, watching what people are doing on the website, trying to figure out why they're not putting things into their cart. And that's when we started to learn. And we actually surveyed the customers again and found this out that people, those people are going to the website to see if the knitting stuff they need is there. And if it is, they're driving to the store. Because that's what they want to do. Yeah. We started offering, there was a discount if you checked out online and then you could still pick it up in the store. But yeah, it's interesting. I think along with trends in technology changing, trends in the way people shop are changing along with that too. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned some of the changes in media as well. And you think back to, you know, magazines is a great place to start. And then there was radio and then there was television and television was going to replace radio. And then along came digital and digital was going to replace print. But the truth of the matter is we still have all those tools at our disposal as marketers, and they all work in different degrees based on how people want to get their information, what their demographic makeup is, where they live, how they act, and all those kinds of things. I just had a, in fact, he might be coming out today, a magazine publisher on our podcast, and he publishes some very high-end lifestyle magazines, and they're just crazy good, entertaining, lots of advertising. And he's just producing this product, very niche oriented to a female audience, but you know, it all still works. And so as a marketer, we have all these tools at our disposal. The hard part is figuring out which one's going to work for which. Well, that's the thing. We got all these tools. That's what I love about being a marketer. That's what I kind of didn't like when I was selling just the magazine or just TV is I had this one tool and I had to make it work. And I wanted to have a bag of tools that I could reach into for my clients. But you're totally right. There's still radio, all that traditional media, radio, TV, billboards, magazines, newspapers, they all have their audience. If you're trying to get to that audience, those are all things that you need to consider in that awareness planning of your marketing plan. But I also think that with all the technology that we're experiencing, there's still nothing like picking up an actual book, smelling that smell when you crack it open, reading without ads popping up at you, same thing with the magazine. I think it's almost like the nostalgic feeling that a writer gets when he goes back to using a typewriter just because. There's just something about it. Yeah. So I don't think we're ever going to see it go away. I think it'll always have its place. I hope so. I think there's a place for it. But certainly digital is where it's at. And it's a shame that some agencies got left behind because they didn't jump on board the digital revolution back a few years ago, quite a few years ago now. But talk a little bit about, we have all these digital channels, how to leverage those to reach an audience and integrating social and email and search and all that together. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, I think I would say going back to understanding that customer, I'm trying to think of a good example. We had a brewery that we were doing marketing for when the pandemic hit. And so this brewery went, they came to us and they said, look, we have to shut our doors 
we can only do delivery and we're going to give you guys X amount of dollars in two months. And if you can't double it, double that money that we're going to invest, we're probably going to be done until we can open up our doors. So we went, okay, what tools do we have? We know the audience. We know the audience is local to this area. We know who they are as far as beer drinkers. We'd already surveyed this audience because we had rebranded this company. So we knew that audience really well. One big sticking point was that this brewery thrived on live events. They weren't going to be able to do live events. They thrived on music. They thrived on, yeah, the music portion, the events, but then they had to revamp their menu and scale it down to make it more affordable and effective for the one or two cooks now they had to scale down to. So they scaled that menu down to pierogies. They were doing these pierogies and they had all different kinds of them and they wanted us to promote it on social media. So we put together a, a plan that promoted the pierogies. You could get the pierogies with beer. We had to bring them from Instagram. They see the ad, they click, they come to the website. They place their order, but in an effort, every restaurant in town was doing the same sort of thing. So in an effort to get people to order through us, we devised a series of promotions. And one of those promotions was a golden ticket giveaway. So every night there was a golden ticket that went into one takeout, one carryout bag. And it was, I think it was, well, we did a few different ones, but the one that sticks out in my mind is it was a the next order you got was on the house. Nice. It had to be like a, for that next order. Yeah. We ran ads on Instagram. We ran ads on social media and we promoted the heck out of that golden ticket giveaway. And that giveaway really catapulted us. So that was one example of, we knew what the outcome had to be. We knew who the audience was. We knew how to get in front of the audience, where they were going to find us, where they were at. We gave a really good call to action, got them in the door, got the sale. And actually on that second time when they come back, especially when, so you got a free meal from this company that's already struggling during the pandemic and you know it because all restaurants were, not many people are going to just come and take their free meal. They're going to tip the staff that brings it out to their car. They're going to probably order some stuff outside of that free meal. So all in all, the campaign went really, really well. But I would say that's a, a good example of how we strategize to use a newer technology like social media. Yeah, integrating everything together so it all works together. Big mm -hmm. idea. Golden ticket. That's a great idea. I might pass that along to a client of mine. Golden ticket. Yeah. <laughs> So you're talking about emerging technologies and tools. And of course, there are, I don't even know what the number is today, thousands, we'll say thousands of podcasts. It could probably, probably there's millions. And yet it's still in its infancy. I have a peer mentor named Drew McClellan, and he has a podcast. And he was interviewing Tom Webster, who is a researcher. And even with all the podcasts that are out there today, we're still in the infancy of podcasts. And of course, you have one called Marketing Fundamentals. What are your thoughts on the potential for this podcast? Podcasting in general, to me, is a major credibility piece. And I think that if companies understand that they can use it in the trust pillar and how to use it, they can monetize it in maybe not such a known way. And I'll give you an example with my own podcast. I think we just produced our ninth episode. We're, we're not like banging them out every week, which I'm getting ready to get back into that. But I built that because A, I wanted to stay true to my mission was to change the way that people think about marketing. But B, was to help with that credibility piece in my own marketing plan. And so what will happen is if you go to my website, you'll see retargeting ads eventually. They won't come right away, but they'll come over the next week or so. And one or two of those retargeting ads are episodes of the Marketing Fundamentals podcast that are topics that are designed to bring you back in. So what happens is, is I meet with a client, you know, they find us through search, say, they come to the website, they book a call with me, I give them a free consultation. And usually after that, I'm creating the proposal before our next meeting. 
And while that's happening, I know they've been to my website and now they're seeing retargeting ads. Some of those retargeting ads are podcast episodes that are on the exact topic and issues that they're meeting with me about. And so they go and click it and they listen. One that we use is we have Carl Coran, the owner of Leafy Organics, who is a company that we helped scale from the ground up, is on the podcast and we talk about how we helped them scale, how we used influencers, things like that. So they listen to that. I earn credibility. They see some of the work that I've done. I gain their trust. They come back for our meeting and they sign the deal as long as it fits within budget and everything. But that's just a way that I don't think a lot of businesses see how that credibility can be monetized like that. I think a lot of times it's, I want to create a podcast. I want to get as many listeners as possible. You know, my brother has a podcast that's designed for that. It's more of an entertainment podcast. Mine's designed a little bit differently. I'm not necessarily trying to get a zillion listeners, although that would be great. And maybe we'll build up to that one day. What I'm trying to do is gain credibility and give people valuable information on how they can market better. Well, I think those are great ideas and, and, and a great objective as well. And that's really good insight for somebody that's thinking about doing a podcast, because I think you're right. You know, the whole idea is I'm going to do a podcast. I'm going to get all these people to listen to me. When the truth of the matter is, there's a very small number of podcasts that have really blown up to size like that. But by having a strategy for what you're trying to accomplish, you can have that podcast do certain things that will ultimately benefit you and be able to monetize that. 100%. What other emerging trends are you seeing using testing right now? Got to be AI, right? Well, AI is a definitely a big one. I love the new chat GPT. I know some marketers, some agencies are not loving it. They feel like it's a threat. To me, it's a just another tool that we can use. And if you have worked with it enough, you know that chat GPT is not going to just go write a blog article for you that is going to be right then and there ready to publish on the website. But if you are a copywriter and you know the questions to ask it. You know, when I write a piece of content using chat GPT, I first lay out what I need that content to do, who the audience is that I'm trying to target with it, what the keywords are that I need infused in it. And I have the AI lay out like a structure for the article. And then I start going through the structure with the AI piece by piece. And we start writing it together, but I'm guiding it the whole way, then I can go back and tweak it, change this, say this, this way. And then usually I'll get it to a point where I copy it and then I go paste it in Google Docs and I finish it writing it myself. So I think, I think it's a great tool. It's going to be very interesting to see where that goes, but I think it's going to be a long time before you're able to if you want to do it right, eliminate a marketing professional. It's somebody that understands communications. I hope you're right. Yeah, for the sake of us both. <laughs> We're using it that way too. Just, you know, use it as a tool to get things going faster, quicker, better. And then you still got to add the brand voice and the tone and style and all that to it. it you know, it's not there. But, I mean, people can say it's there. I mean, I've had somebody bring me an article and it's like, Hey, this is pretty good. We could publish that. Right. I'm like, have you verified everything? Is that really our tone? Come on. But it is a great tool to accelerate the process and do lots of other things too. Yeah. But you definitely have to make sure, like you said, it's in the right brand voice and it's everything's verified. And especially if you're going to be using it for homework, kids, <laughs> make sure you fact check everything that it says in that <laughs> report that it wrote for you because you can get in trouble fast. That's the truth. Another thing that I wanted to touch on briefly going back to the podcasting is that a lot of companies are starting podcasts. They're using it in that credibility or trust pillar. And I can see this moving more towards, because because really it all boils down to content. Podcasting is also a great way to have new content to publish on a continuous basis for things like LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram, and all these places that we want to hold a presence as a business. I can see this now getting into us creating more like reality style shows for businesses. And that's something that we're actually working on right now for ourselves. And we're going to be getting into offering for other companies. 
is creating a show and creating a structure for that show so that you can easily create more episodes of that show, but it's actually video that you can publish and then taking that long form episode and chopping it down into say 10 pieces of bite-sized video that you can publish to all these channels so that you're continuously providing value in the form of information and keeping a presence. So I could see like the podcast thing kind of taking on that form as well. Absolutely. There are a lot of people that are doing a pretty good job of kind of slicing and dicing, you know, making video snippets and pulling out little quotes and sound bites and distributing those. The idea of a reality show for business is clever. I like that. I, I made a note of that one. I got to think about that one. We're working on it right now and we're doing something for a lead plan. I don't want to say too much about it, but it's it's super cool. I'm really excited about it, but I think that, yeah, that direction would be good for businesses that are structured properly to be able to do it. Well, you know, that allows somebody to be authentic, right? Because you're going to be shooting them yep. as it is. Authenticity is pretty important today. Part of that building the trust. Yeah, totally. Probably need to wind down. I want to be sensitive to your schedule today, but do want to talk just a minute about rural America. You know, a lot of what we've talked about today, probably all, is totally relevant to our audience. You know, CEOs, CMOs, CFOs of small to mid sized businesses who are wondering how to market to people out in the country, out in rural America, small cities. When I mentioned the phrase rural America, we kind of talked about this as we were warming up. What's your perception of rural America? Rural America to me is small town USA. I live in a small town and I have a lot of even smaller towns and farmland surrounding us. Small town, I guess, also to me means tight knit. So going to businesses who are marketing to that audience, it's almost in a way easier because you can expand with word of mouth faster than you can in a major market. People in small towns, and mine included, you know, you mess up somebody's marketing here, word's going to travel fast. Or or somebody's roof, if you're a roofing contractor, word's <laughs> going to travel fast. Reputation is everything in these small markets. But, you know, along with that, if I just look at my own life and like if a business wanted to market to me here, and I think a lot of the guys that I hang out with, especially in this area, we're into hunting, we're into fishing, we're into camping and outdoors. I mean, just understanding that about your market. And, you know, if I was a pizza place, I may be advertising at local schools, right? In that tight knit community, sporting events, like all the like the little bass fishing tournaments that happen around town, ice fishing tournaments that happen around town. There's a lot of really affordable ways to advertise newsletters that some of the bigger local companies will put out, magazines, those tight knit communities. I think there's lots of ways to have affordable marketing. Another one that just popped into my head is our local YMCA which you can buy ads on the screen in the gym, which I've always loved. I've advertised my own podcast actually on those because I know a lot of business owners go to the local YMCA as their gym. And what better place to get them than walking on a treadmill with nothing to do, you know, and hit them with an ad. Captive audience. Yeah, let us sweat your marketing. <laughs> <laughs> That's pillar number one, P1, be found, right? That's right. Targeted. Yeah. Hey, this has been great, John. I've really enjoyed visiting with you. You've had a lot of great insight to share with our audience. I appreciate that very much. I want to take a minute again to pitch your podcast, Marketing Fundamentals, and your book, Stop Guessing and Start Marketing. If somebody wants to find you, I'm sure they can just Google Lead Plan Marketing. But what else would you like to share with our OutDrive audience that you think they might find interesting or maybe inspiring? I would just end it with, you know, I always think that the most important thing about marketing is really understanding your audience. Do the extra work to understand that audience. Put yourself in their shoes. Think about, I always do this when I create a marketing plan. I try to put myself in the exact shoes of that person I'm trying to attract and walk myself through that buyer's journey, awareness, consideration, decision, 
what would I want to see at this point? What would I, and I love, I'm the type of guy that loves being sold. I love a good marketing strategy or sales process. And I can see myself being led down it, but if it's done right, I'm like, oh yeah, what are they going to do next? You know? So I would just say, really think about that. Think about your audience. Think about that emotional reasoning behind why they would make a purchase. If you're selling mattresses, maybe they're making a purchase because their current mattress is hurting their back. And what does that mean for them? If it hurts their back, they're stiff, they're sore, they're in pain. Talk to that in your messaging, you know, that sort of thing. Great insight. Appreciate you sharing that. Thanks, Cliff. Thanks for having me on. This was a, it was a great time. I really enjoyed it. Same here. Folks, thanks for listening to Doubt Drive. I hope you've enjoyed our visit today with John Smitty, founder, president, and lead strategist at Lead Plan Marketing. Come back again next week, and I'll take you down the roads of rural America, where it's heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCallus.com for more insight you can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day, and keep on driving.